speaker is Dwayne Lee from Columbia Astronomy. And Bill. And what? Okay. Oh, yeah. yes, I'm sorry. Two speakers here. Does not have to hit play? No, no, it gives you the last slide. That'll get, okay, then you do it. I'll do it. Dwayne's going to talk about reconnect, reconstructing the galactic halo's accretion history, a finite mixture model. Let's hope it works. Yes? Ah, ah, I Simulation from 
my advisor's work at Johnson, uh, uh, along with uh, James Bullock. And what you'll see is that uh, in the center you have a disc that represents uh, the, the galactic disc, and uh, it has some gravitational potential due to that central disc. And as um, the simulation goes on, you have all these satellite dwarf galaxies coming in and then uh, merging uh, with, with the, the galaxy in the center and forming this large spheroid that you would um, consider the um, galactic halo of, of that system. Okay. And if I run this again quickly, what you should know is that each of these uh, dwarf galaxies have different colors to allow you to see how the distribution of the stars that belong to them is, is redistributed. And so we start to see features um, like tidal streams wrapping around the disk um, and, and these uh, splashback events of, of stars as they, they go uh, through the galaxy and then, then come back. And so what's, what's awesome about uh, this, this picture is that, in fact, when we look at um, observations, uh, we see these same sort of features. So this is uh, a observation from the, uh, the pandas uh, uh, team. So this is like Pan um, Andromeda uh, 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 survey, essentially, which looks at star counts around. So this this center part right here, the small part, would be the the, the optical disk that I showed you before of the Andromeda galaxy, um, and so. Uh, so they, take, they, they took this survey, and so you have essentially star counts um, in and around uh, Andromeda, and what you find is in fact this evidence for hierarchical emergence. So you, you see that the, the stellar halo has substructure. So in, in the monolithic collapse model, essentially when you form, form this, because this is all kind of random uh, fragmentation, you should have a smooth halo. You shouldn't see any substructure. So this is um, seeing the substructure as, as we've seen in the, the Milky Way, but this is uh, even more impressive to see a number of, of loops um, uh, and, and actual dwarfs that might belong to these uh, actual um, tidal tails and streams uh, that this is lends uh, almost definite credence to uh, higher emerging being the main uh, mode of, of galaxy formation. And so what's also cool about this is that you can use dyna dynamical models, uh, such as the one that I showed previously, to try to extract the recent uh, accretion history. So you can actually run these streams uh, back into time and, and find the, the coherent um, galaxy that was a progenitor to these, to these streams and, and some of these over densities. And so that gives you uh, some insight into how the, the galaxy actually formed. And that, that informs our, our ideas about um, the many different aspects of, of galaxy formation and, and even the, the, the evolution of the, the, the universe as a whole, um, because this has to fit into that larger cosmological picture. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is a, uh, a limit to what you do with that sort of technique. And that, that has to do with this uh, phase mixing which limits the how far it is it, it, you can actually run uh, this this information sort of back into time. And that's essentially because these streams over time will get washed out, um, and, and certainly in the uh, uh, simulation you saw that some of the earlier uh, uh, <coughs> dwarfs that fell in uh, essentially started to form this kind of more smooth uh, halo component. So um, this is a snapshot from those same simulations that I showed you before. And this is just, once again, to point out that we do, in fact, see these features in uh, the simulations that uh, s uh, closer in, you start to get maybe more of a smooth uh, halo distribution. So this would be um, galaxies that fell in uh, early on, uh, where most of their, their signature <coughs> of, of, of Parents has kind of um, been, been washed out. And then further out, you, you find plenty of, uh, of dwarf galaxies that have yet to fall in and, and really start to interact um, tidally. And so 
uh, these, these simulations were, were cosmologically motivated, uh, and, and these are um, surf, surf, surface brightness maps uh, showing the distribution of stars. So knowing that there's this, there's this limit in, to what you can do with um, these uh, surface density um, phase space uh, uh, sorts of, uh, uh, of data, how, how can you press even further back? How can you infer more from the information we get from halo stars to figure out more about uh, uh, galaxy evolution in our own galaxy and, and galaxies nearby? And so uh, what I'm showing here is, in fact, a way to uh, achieve this. So this is a 2D uh, metallicity plot. So on the y-axis is, is alpha over at B. So the alpha elements are things like titanium, magnesium, and calcium. Uh, and then uh, at B, of course, of H, iron over hydrogen. And, and the physics behind that is, it, behind these uh, two axes, is not so important to the overall point. Just note that these are two different ways that you can uh, measure the amount of chemical enrichment that has happened in uh, these stellar systems over time. And, and so what I really want to point out here is that stars actually remember their, their genetic history. That's to say that the chemical abundances that they inherited from a previous generations of stars via the supernovas that went off in that, 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 that past um, star formation event is then transferred to any stars that are now formed out of that, that new gas. And so that mixture is just then locked up into um, the atmospheres of those stars. So when we, we study them and we split up the light uh, spectroscopically, we can then measure these, these different abundances in, in the stars. And so if that's the case, then it doesn't matter uh, when those stars fell in. Uh, you, you can, in, in, in essence, in, you know, uh, at least in, in principle, uh, essentially uh, identify them with a particular uh, body of, of stars that they, they, they grew out of, um, were born out of. And so here on this plot, uh, you have um, a number of, of stellar data points. This is observations uh, from the halo and uh, from some low mass uh, galaxies, so on and so forth. But the main thing I want to point out is that their distributions are, are spread out in this, this uh, 2D plane. And so they, they do occupy, tend to occupy certain regions of this 2D metallicity space, precisely because of the specific nature of the environment that those stars were born on. And that, that's actually tagged to the type of gas, so the galaxy or um, stellar system that they're um, related to. And so that, that gives us some, some information about uh, the type of, of uh, system, dwarf galaxy that they belong to, um, but also pointing out that, for instance, for instance this is a low mass system, whereas uh, systems here uh, are, are higher mass uh, dwarfs. And so uh, you can also start to look at this in terms of, of um, for instance, the mass of the, the, the progenitor or the mass of the, the galaxy that they belong to actually affecting the types of stars that they create. So uh, understanding that we can start to ha have this information, see, this, see these relationships, uh, you can now go back to the models uh, uh, that I showed you earlier and I'll point out that they also had a semi-analytical treatment of metal enrichment uh, in those models by the star formation. And so uh, if, if you haven't kind of noticed already, uh, the, star, the colors here represent the mass of the uh, galaxy to which they belong. So purple uh, to black is low mass, uh, uh, you know, blue then to green, yellow and orange is higher mass. And so the same sort of situation that we saw in observations where low mass is here, higher mass is here, it's what you, you, you we, we do, um, we're able to reproduce in the simulations, even with, uh, with considered a simple 
treatment of, of, of chemical enrichment. This, this is by no means the most complicated uh, uh, approach to, to uh, tracking chemical enrichment or, or producing any of these simulations. So um, the, knowing that, how do we take that information and then uh, apply it um, <clears throat> to, in fact, uh, be able to have a better reconstruction or a more complete reconstruction of, of the <coughs> accretion history of the, the galaxy. So uh, in, in those simulations uh, by uh, Bullock uh, and Johnston, we have 11 halo realizations. Uh, and in those, those halo, halo realizations, we have 1,500 uh, simulated accreted dwarf galaxies. And so in each one of those dwarf galaxies has their own chemical enrichment history. And so that's, that's uh, signified by these, these tracks, which are, are tracks in this kind of average metallicity enrichment over time, uh, where the colors kind of represent uh, the uh, relative number of stars that have a particular uh, chemical abundance in this 2D space. So about 1,500, 1500 per realization? No, I mean 1,500 total. Overall uh, realizations. Overall realizations, yes. And so. Um, uh, each halo has a subset of that 1,500. Anyway. Um, and so the, the idea is that you, you, you go from the, you know, these halo realizations, uh, you, you, you have these 1,500 uh, possible possibilities uh, in terms of how your, your, your dwarf galaxies will look, in part due to their mass, and also in part due to the fact that once they're accreted, star formation is cut off. And so that's also a, uh, another key point of this model. And what you could do is you could take um, galaxies that have similar chemical enrichments uh, and, and have similar, um, I'm sorry, actually, that have similar masses um, and similar accretion times. And, and what you find is that generally they have similar uh, chemical enrichment patterns. And you can bin them uh, together to get some sort of uh, uh, average uh, a galaxy for a particular uh, accretion time and a particular mass. And from there, you can start to form this set of templates that are going to represent, um, well, particular galaxies accreting at, at, at particular times. And so the idea here then is uh, by doing that, <coughs> uh, depending on how you want to go, you can actually set up this master template, uh, a series of, of of these dwarfs um, that that have various uh, I'm sorry uh, various um, characteristics based on their uh, mass. So on the y-axis here, you have uh, bins of, of 10 to 8 to 10 to 9 solar masses, uh, 10 to the 7 to 8, so on and so forth. Down here, so, so this is the masses for each of the dwarfs. So, so it's the masses for each of the, the dwarfs. Yes. Okay, and then um, the, the the stellar mass, and then uh, on the x-axis you have the accretion time. So you have from zero to two <coughs> giga years. So that's recent, <coughs> and then two to eight, eight to ten, and and so just to point out, uh, this this particular mass template um, was was kind of made uh, with a, a kind of a best guess as to how some of these things could break down, but it, by it, any means it's not the most optimal way of, of slicing or you know bidding up these uh, accretion times and, 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 ma and masses per se. Uh, but what you do see is that when you do this, you're able to uh, recover certain uh, relationships that we've known to exist for quite some time in, in, in astronomy. So that's, for instance, the uh, mass metallicity relationship. So as you go from lower mass to higher mass in this one uh, time column, you see that uh, things become more metal rich. And, and, and just to point out, uh, this is a logarithmic scale. So zero is, is solar metallicity. And so over time, things become closer to a solar metallicity. Um, and then also in, in the looking at a particular mass, uh, what you're able to get is uh, a difference in your alpha abundances. So you find that um, things become more alpha enhanced as you go back 
point in time. This is something that we also see in our own galaxy. When we look at the galactic bulge, we believe that that was formed early on. That's actually alpha enhanced compared to stars uh, uh, in, in the disk. So more these metal are rich. Well, oh, yeah, well, yes. Just in terms of yes, sorry, yes. More metal rich, it, it, rich in, in this, this yeah, measure. Um, OK, so, so the, the question is, is Sorry, how do you go from this master template, apply it to, so this is Halo 2 um, in our realization, to this distribution of what are uh, observed stars from the halo, to then get this output. And so this output would actually be the accretion history of this halo. And so that's, that's very important. What we're looking for is that you put a certain master template in, you apply it, um, some way to your actual data, and then it spits out um, what it believes is the the best um, ratio for luminosity contribution from these from these different satellites. And from the luminosity contribution to the halo, you can then start to look at quantities like the, the number of, of of dwarf galaxies of this nature that fell in, so on and so forth. So the so the real key here is, is this is a way to get past that, that dynamical kind of wall in terms of how far back you can look into time and, and try to infer um, the actual formation of, of the galaxy. You've got 16 there, right? Yes, and right. You've got, and you're covering a lot of the parameter space. So I'm sure it's not hard to find a model that will work. Right, <laughs> no, that's true. So so like I guess, so this is, um, well, that, that, that is in fact the case. So in this case, um, I also point out that the numbers actually work well um, because this was a, t a test case. So this was the case where we took the, the actual accretion history and applied it to the, the halo and, and you know, the test. So yeah, so it actually, the, the numbers aren't necessarily that good, especially when you break up your information into such small time events as, as Will's going to point out in, in, in a moment. So, so um, so actually getting to uh, essentially what Will's going to be discussing, one such way to uh, do this um, is the uh, expectation and maximization algorithm. And so uh, just to really solidify um, everything that we're trying to uh, achieve here, uh, the question is, can we reconstruct the accretion history of the galactic halo um, or the galaxy uh, from stellar dis distributions in 2D metallicity space? And so I can, I can tell you, as I, I, I mentioned a couple of slides back, that you you can actually look at these distributions and make some coarse um, um, uh, make some coarse uh, points about where uh, certain contributions to the halo came from, the, the type of galaxies that, that contributed. So I know that uh, uniquely stars in this region come from low mass uh, uh, systems, and so. Uh, this is a lower mass system. Uh, I also know here because of just the way that the temples looked at, you're, you're, you, if there's going to be a contribution from an even lower mass system here, it's going to be in this region. So we know in a, in a coarse way how uh, these galaxies could contribute to this whole middle mid distribution. The real question is, um, can we get um, you know a, a, a finer account of how the uh, the galaxy was constructed. And so uh, with that, I'll leave the rest of that explanation to my colleague. So uh, given all these, uh, these templates that we have, uh, we proposed a generative model for the observations, uh, these guys. And we say that for each observation, it is generated from one of the mixture components, shown here on the left. Um, again, these mixture components, uh, as we discussed earlier, are from 1,500 simulated satellites, whereas when we do observations, this is from a smaller subset. So the model that we are using to fit the observations um, is more, much more general than the actual observation itself. And since each of these mixture components has an associated time since accretion range and mass range, we can actually reconstruct the formation history of the halo. We know what percentage of observations In a little more detail, if we let x be alpha over fd and y be fd over h, our model, given m mixture components, is as follows. It is a weighted sum of the m mixture components 
where the mixture proportion is denoted by IJ, and that denotes again the percentage of the observations that come from that particular mixture component. And the mixture component FJ is one of the different components that Dwayne showed you earlier. Um, in the previous illustration, I showed you the case of four, um, and Dwayne showed you the case of 25. The mixing proportions themselves have to sum up to one, and each one must be greater than or equal to zero. So we ran this model for two overall kind of sets. We did a five by five grid of mixture components, shown on the left. And we also ran a number of two by two grids, uh, shown on the right, with four mixing components. The idea being that the choice of a five by five grid was somewhat arbitrary. It was based on um, some astronomical intuitions. Uh, and we thought that we might be able to get better results if we did a two by two grid, um, especially because we're want to have a, a method that works with a small number of observations. We don't want to require, say, 500,000 observations. That wouldn't be very useful. So these are some results for the 5 by 5 grid. We have the true values uh, of pi, which are the mixing proportions, which we know since this is simulated data. And we have our estimated values, which are plotted as green crosses, along with some confidence interval. As you can see, the true values line up into standard deviations of our estimated values in all the cases, even when the mixture components or the mixing proportions are rather small. So if we have a mixture uh, component that contributes a half a percentage point of overall luminosity, we're still able to recover that accurately. Um, we didn't have success with all halo realizations on for a five by five grid. So when we switched to a two by two grid, um, we actually saw really good results. Here I've plotted uh, the absolute differences between our estimated values of the mixing proportions and the true values on the left for all 11 halo realizations. So that means there are 44 points here. And as you can see, the absolute differences are relatively small. Um, on the right, we have the percentage differences. They're slightly larger, but in general, we don't have anything off by orders of magnitude. So we have a, we're able to reconstruct the true mixing proportions fairly well. These two outliers you see at the top that are 100% off are because the true values are zero, whereas our algorithm gave us something along the range of 10 to the minus 20. So it's off by a lot, but we think that's okay. So how did we get these mixing proportions? Tell us what was the complication with the 5 by 5? Sorry? What was, it that, what was it that went wrong with the 5 by 5? Um, we think the grid was too granular. Basically, it's, uh, the grid was very specific. And our choice of 5 by 5 was motivated by the fact that we thought 25 uh, mixture components was a good number. And so we just we divide, we partition the mass and time secretion range equally, fairly equally, and just ran it. Uh, it turns out that if you look at all of the simulated data, you can see that uh, a lot of the simulated halos in certain mass ranges are very similar. And so it's, it's pretty much impossible to tell the difference. So to estimate the mixing proportions, uh, a natural approach would be to use maximum likelihood, which uh, in our case, well, maximum likelihood is basically a way to find out the most likely uh, estimate. If, let's say, you have a normal density uh, characterized by some mean mu and some variance sigma, you just, the maximum likelihood allows you to pick those two parameters to maximize the joint probability uh, of all data. In our case, that means that our maximum likelihood estimate is the R max with respect to pi of our log likelihood, which is pictured here. This is pretty simple to derive from our model definition. Unfortunately, we can't really uh, differentiate this with respect to pi. So standard maximum likelihood techniques aren't going to work. But uh, expectation maximization provides a way for us to do this. Suppose that we knew which mixture component FJ each observation came from. We could then construct what we call a latent indicator variable called ZIJ. That is one if data point I comes from mixture component J and zero otherwise. If we have this, we can then express a complete log likelihood in this form, which as you can see, is much easier to differentiate with respect to pi. So then we can easily get the, uh, an estimate for the mixing proportions. Unfortunately, we don't know the values of this uh, latent indicator variable, but it's not a problem with expectation maximization. What we do
do is we replace this unknown latent variable z with the expected value of z conditioned on our data and on the previous value of the mixing proportions. With that means expectation maximization is an iterative approach. And so at each time p, we get an estimate for the mixing proportion, which is the argmax with respect to pi and the expected value of the log likelihood. Uh, again, with the log likelihood, we replace z with the expected value of z. How do you start? Good question. We pick random numbers, and it turns out uh, our algorithm is completely insensitive to initialization. We can use random numbers, we can use uh, uniform numbers, it doesn't matter at all. It always converges to the same values. So we just pick random, random values. Um, it's a two-step algorithm. First step is to find the, uh, the expected value of the latent variable z. So we can have uh, a log likelihood that we can take the argument. We repeat this until our log likelihood stabilizes. In our case, we picked a range of 10 to the minus 4. Um, this was arbitrary. We let it run for longer, and nothing really happened. So in a little bit more detail, um, when I say we find the expected value of the log likelihood using the current expected value of the latent variable, it sounds a little vague. Um, what we're really doing is evaluating this guy here. This is actually just the log likelihood we saw before. Uh, with zij replaced by the expected value of zij. And since this <coughs> latent variable is an indicator, its expected value is simply the probability that point i comes from model j, which, using the definition of conditional probability, we can express in an equal analytical form. We then take this, this value of zij, and we can plug it back into our log likelihood, and take the argmax with respect to pi, and Analytically, at each time t, this is our estimate of the mixing proportions, which is very easy to compute. You can see this wij is just the expected value of z from the previous slide. And uh, we've got pretty good results with this few of thousand observations. With more data, we can have narrower confidence intervals, uh, and we can be more confident. we're sensitive to initialization of uh, pi. Uh, one common criticism of the EM algorithm is that it's quite slow to converge. Uh, in our case, for a uh, two by two grid, it took about 60 iterations to converge. Uh, and in the case of a five by five grid, like the ones that Dwayne showed you originally, it took about 600 iterations to converge, uh, which is a while. But we did identify large weights after about 10 iterations. So if you look at the plot on the right, uh, these lines are a little faint, but you can see that after about 10 trials, there isn't a whole lot of change going on. This again is percent change in mixing proportions. Uh, and after 20, it's, it's very, very flat. Uh, also, I should say that for 60 iterations, it takes 0.3 seconds to run. So I think that's pretty quick. And again, it always converges. So we ran the algorithm many, many, many times, and we never had the problem of uh, one mixing proportion was 5% one time, and 27% the next time. We always converged on the exact same answers. Um, so given that we have some estimates of these mixing proportions, it would be useful to have at least confidence intervals. We were actually able to reconstruct full covariance matrices uh, for these mixing proportions. We know that the asymptotic covariance matrix of pi hat can be approximated by the inverse of the observed Fisher information matrix, which I'm sure you all know. <coughs> this form, which is not too tough to calculate. Uh, we can then, of course, get the variance and the correlation. This is a plot of one of the two by two results. Again, we have the true values of pi as the circles, the estimates as the crosses, and one and two standard deviation confidence intervals. You can see that the true and estimated values um, are very close, and the true value is always within two standard deviations. We also did n out of n bootstrapping and got essentially the same results uh, at a 95% confidence level. Uh, since we had the full uh, covariance matrix, we are also able to calculate correlation. Again, we did this using the Fisher information method that I showed earlier, along with n out of n bootstrapping, and we got almost exactly the same results. Uh, these two plots, the one on the left is for the five by five grid, and the one on the right is for one of the two by two grids. The larger the dot, the bigger the 
correlation, negative correlations are red, positive ones are blue. Uh, you can see that the closer two mixing proportions are to each other, uh, sorry, the, the closer two mixture components are to each other, in general, they have slightly larger correlations. This makes sense because we gridded up the time since accretion and the mass range. Uh, sequentially, and so two mixture components are next to each other, they have similar times of secretion and masses. Ideally, these, of course, would all be small. But. So, in conclusion, we were able to reconstruct the formation history using a two by two grid very well with a single finite mixture model. Uh, we trained this model on a global set of data, so we used all of the information we had from simulations to create one model. And then we generated 11 random halo realizations using smaller subsets of our data. We ran it through the model, and we were able to reconstruct information history. Uh, it was relatively quickly. It didn't take us very long. We didn't have problems with small values of pi. So if, let's say, uh, one of our mixture components contributed 90%, well, not 50 percent of the mass, we were able to identify it just as quickly as if it had contributed half a percent or more. Uh, and our method scales, so we can change the number of mixture components and the amount of data very easily. As far as confidence intervals in covariance matrices, we used two separate methods that produced essentially the same results, which is quite promising. As far as improvements, there are two main avenues that we we're working on right now. One of them is um, adaptive partitioning of the mass and time since accretion. Um, when we make these, these sets of mixture components, we're just kind of drawing lines um, somewhat arbitrarily. And as I mentioned for the five by five grid, we had the problem where sometimes these different mixture components were essentially the same. So we have, have several methods that uh, allow us to adaptively partition so that we set the partitions to maximize the distance or the difference or something like that between uh, the different mixture components. Um, we're still in the early stages, but we have some promising results. Uh, and another improvement that we were thinking of doing that might increase the accuracy of this would be to take uh, the 1500 uh, simulated metallicity curves that you saw at the very end of Dwayne's presentation and to directly smooth them uh, using some sort of weighted kernel smoothing and then to construct a mixture model with those 1500 components. That approach would also be compatible with adaptive partition. So I uh, just want <coughs> to end with some final comments. And that is to say that uh, the 2D metallicities are a start. Um, so uh, this is a great proof of a concept. There's things that you can actually, we believe we can actually do with this now um, as evidence of, of, of some of the results. But there are more dimensions to come. And so uh, this is kind of a, a burgeoning field of uh, subfield of, of large Archaeology. And so, uh, in terms of dimensions, it's uh, more um, uh, chemical abundances for uh, different uh, particular types of processes that go on. So, uh, uh, in terms of uh, supernovas going off, there's there's uh, processes that that uh, produce certain uh, uh, chemicals uh, or elements, and, and others that, that, that produce others. And so, uh, with those more dimensions, we can actually make even finer splits in terms of the environments um, from which those, those stars were created. Um, and and uh, in addition to that, our methods are only strengthened by these larger data sets. So there's, there are uh, a number of surveys that are slated um, such that we're, we're looking to get two to three um, uh, uh, levels of, of, of magnitude in terms of the number of, of stars we have now, which is uh, for the, the halo, uh, roughly a, a thousand if you're talking about um, uh, good chemical abundance data, but we're looking to increase that to uh, perhaps uh, uh, 10,000 and, and, and maybe um, uh, 100,000 um, within, within the, the, uh, uh, the end of this decade. And then uh, finally, um, adding a more physical interpretation um, of the models uh, will perhaps allow us to sort um, the galaxies, and, and so that might uh, help improve our, our model templates and, and, and um, uh, essentially well, improve what we can, we can say about the accretion history of these galaxies. Thank you. More questions for Wayne and Will? Did you say again what the data set was you used and how many stars were? 
Okay, so um, the, the data set comes from uh, uh, Bullock and Johnson 05. So these are, uh, right now it's just all simulated data. Um, and uh, like I mentioned before, they, they had uh, simulated 11 different halos uh, using a, a semi-analytic uh, uh, chemical Understand simulation. The right. Where did you compare this against a sample of stars? Oh, uh, no, so, so the, oh, ah, okay, how do we generate the, the sample of stars? So the, uh, essentially, um, we took the uh, actual distribution, so there's, a, there's star particles in these simulations, and those star particles had uh, alpha or FE, FE, FE or H um, metal is associated with each star particle as a part of the, the halo that's created. Um, and so the and, the and those in fact come from the accreted dwarfs, uh, and so what we do is we look at the halo and then uh, essentially based off of the cumulative distribution function of the of, of uh, the luminosity of um, sorry of uh, dwarf uh, contribution, we randomly choose from that to reproduce the stellar you know observations from that halo. So what that ensures is that you get the right proportions um, of stars contributed from uh, low mass dwarfs, which is a, a, very, a very low number, to uh, the most massive dwarf, which gives you the bulk of the stars that you see in that distribution. And what's, what's amazing about this, this uh, technique is that, uh, as, as Will pointed out, if it's 50%, if it's 1%, it doesn't matter because it really focuses on the fact that these stars populate different uh, parts of that 2D. Uh, you said you said that your two by two was physically motivated when you decided the five by five wasn't working very well. Well, and am I right? Is that what you said? Am I right about that? So, yes. Uh, this thing is so fast. Uh, why bother? Why not just try a whole bunch of different combinations and see which gives you the best results in the end? Anyway. That's one of the ideas we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. I mean, you said it's uh, time consuming, but it didn't look very time consuming. Just no. Just so quickly, no. you don't have to worry about that. So you can explore the whole space. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Did you oh. If you were to do that, like this adaptive part, how do you have you thought about how to handle the number of partitions that are transferred? Did you introduce some kind of complexity thing? Uh, we could. I think right now we're thinking of just some arbitrary numbers for that, but we definitely could use some, there are many statistical techniques uh, to do that. I would also add that at some point in time, uh, it becomes un unreasonable it's, uh, in terms of, of um, the actual data that's out there. So the ability to uh, you kind of narrow these these time bins, for instance, or, or you know, the, at some level, it, there's, there's just not enough information to make such fine um, distinctions between Dwarfs that are, that are created. So, right. So that also limits the number of bins. We're not going to like you know, fifteen hundred by you know fifteen hundred. Right. <coughs> okay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Um, can you or have you thought about adding sort of spatial information? For example, with co-moving groups, and that, and that obviously gives you very strong evidence that uh, there's a particular uh, yeah. remnant. That, you know, in that string right there. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. I, I actually got that pre precise uh, uh, idea yesterday. I, I can't remember why, why from what talk, but that, that's exactly what I was thinking of. So, so our, our first. Hopefully, it was by talk. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually, <laughs> it might have been, but, um, but our first idea was, you know, it's simply kind of zero order. You, you scrap. You, you you don't worry about the, um, like I said, this phase based information, but. Uh, Clearly, as you, you know, when you look at the, the simulations, even though you don't have like these streams per se, there's still some some information in terms of the distribution of, of those stars in, in general. So so maybe uh, when they accrete early on, there's some extra um, um, constraints because uh, many of those stars will live in these streams. But if, if they accreted, um, I'm sorry, if they accreted later on, if they accreted er earlier on, they might be more of a smooth distribution, but that might have there might be some constraints in terms of 
um, you know, the extent of, of that. And so I, I think that, yes, there is a, an extra. Well, looking forward to Gaia, where you're going to have proper motion for so many stars. Right, right, absolutely, yeah. So it would be. Great. You, you got yeah that and, and with Moss 